Today is the beginning of my second teaching on the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit. I tell you, this is powerful. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit have revolutionized my life. I can't even imagine. How do you deal with things without the power of the Holy Spirit? God never intended us to live the Christian life on our own. Here's a statement that some of you need to write this down or something because this, this could revolutionize your life if you could get this. But the Christian life isn't just difficult to live or hard to live. It's impossible to live on your own. God never intended for you to live under your own strength and power. I think it's Zechariah 4, 6, it says uh, the Lord was speaking to Jerubbabel and he had told him, or uh, Zerubbabel, I think. I, anyway, it's one of those guys over there, Zechariah 4, 6, and he was supposed to be building the temple and it just looked impossible. It was an impossible task. And he said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And God never intended for us to live the Christian life on our own. We were intended to commit our life, receive His salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then it's like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, it's not me living, it's Christ living through me. And the way He does that is through the Holy Spirit. And God intended for us to be God-possessed and just have His power flowing through us. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is where this begins. Just receiving a second experience with the Lord with, that I'm calling the baptism of the Holy Spirit because this is what John referred to, Jesus referred to it, the disciples referred to it, and so that's the biblical name is the baptism of the Holy Spirit or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just receiving that experience doesn't guarantee perfection or maturity, but it is the open door to it. It is the way to it. And I guarantee you, I just don't believe you are going to reach spiritual maturity without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, let me just turn over here. This is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples. And in Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 1, Then when the day and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Notice the wording here. It says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began. You could say, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Holy Spirit inspires speaking in tongues, but He doesn't speak in tongues. He doesn't take your mouth and it just comes out and it's uncontrollable. Matter of fact, I'll be dealing with this more, but if you go into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Lord through Paul, rebuked the Corinthians church because they were just getting up and speaking in tongues, everybody speaking in tongues without any interpretation. And he rebuked them and he says, make it only two or the maximum of three messages in tongues at a church service and only if there's a person to interpret it. And the immediate response of some people, I know just because I deal with people, somebody would say, but I can't help it. It's the Holy Spirit. He came back and he says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What he's saying is that you can control speaking in tongues. Did you know right now I could speak in tongues? But I'm not because it wouldn't benefit you. It's not what the scripture tells us to do. I need to speak in a known language. And so I can control whether I speak in tongues. So I say all of this to say that I had this dramatic, life-changing experience where I was filled with the Holy Spirit on March the 23rd, 1968. But it was three and a half years later when I finally spoke in tongues. And it was because I was taught against it. I was fearful of it. And the Lord isn't going to force you to speak in tongues. So let me put some things together here that, you know, I, I believe you can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues because I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I'm not speaking in tongues right now. It's up to me if I speak in tongues. And somebody, I know there's somebody, that, well, you're just saying that you can turn on and off the Holy Spirit anytime you want to. You can just pray in tongues. You can get control Him. 
No, I'm not turning him on and off. It's me that I'm turning on and off. And I could pray in tongues right now. I can speak in English. I choose to speak in English because I'm trying to communicate with you. And so because the Holy Spirit doesn't force you to speak in tongues, I received this dramatic encounter. I had been seeking God because I knew that there was more in my life. And I could spend literally a whole week telling you everything that led up to this experience. But just to summarize it, I had been seeking God, knowing that there was something more. And finally, I had a breakthrough and I experienced God in a supernatural way. I mean, it was dramatic and it has changed my life. That's been 49 years ago and I have never gotten over it. I'm never going to get over it. It is one of the most powerful things that I've ever had. And I didn't speak in tongues right then, but here's the point. Three and a half years later, and it's a long story. I'm not going to take time to go through the whole thing, but finally I started speaking in tongues and it was a major deal with me. And here's the reason for bringing that up is that when I started speaking in tongues, it's like I got baptized in the Holy Spirit all over again. It was one thing to have this experience and to have the Holy Spirit come alive. And like I said, the Word of God just came alive to me. And I was receiving a lot of benefit from receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when I started speaking in tongues, it's just like this dynamo starts up on the inside of me and it starts the uh, flow of the Holy Spirit. And part of the reason for this, this is not a, this again isn't a great technical explanation, but when you speak in tongues, it's foolishness to your mind. And we spend an entire life trying to keep from being foolish, trying to say things that make us look smart. We want everybody to uh, accept us and stuff. And when you start speaking in tongues, the Bible says it's foolishness to your mind. It's not your mind speaking. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 14 says, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. It's not your brain. It's your spirit, your born again spirit where the life of God is. And when you speak in tongues, your mind is just out of control. Now it has to give permission. Again, God's not going to force it upon you. You have to put yourself into agreement and accept it, but it's not coming from your mind. Matter of fact, one of the things that I noticed was when I received the gift of speaking in tongues, like if I'm reading right here in uh, Acts chapter 2, you know, I can't read these verses and quote, Mary had a little lamb or sing some song that is engaging my mind. I can't read with my mind and do something else with my mind at the same time. There's some people that glory in being multitaskers and they think they can, but in my opinion, all that means is you do multiple things poorly. If you are going to be reading something right here, you have to be focused on what you're doing. But when I pray in tongues, I could pray in tongues right now and I could pray in tongues for an hour and read these verses and I not only could focus on it and totally receive what's here, I would actually get better revelation from it. And the reason for that is because when I'm praying in tongues, it's not my brain praying. It's my spirit praying. And so you can still occupy your mind. Matter of fact, you've got to occupy your mind. You just can't turn it off. Every once in a while, I meet some people that look like they've turned their brain off. But the truth is, you are thinking something all of the time. And so if it's your spirit that's praying in tongues, you got to do something with your mind. And what you do is, I pray with my understanding, my mind, and I pray with my spirit at the same time. And I mean, the Lord did a bunch of this. He did this for me many, many times. But like I said, when you're praying in tongues, your spirit is praying. So you got to do something with your mind. So I just chose to pray with my mind. I was praying in my thoughts the whole time that I was speaking in tongues out loud. And I would do this for hours at a time. Back when I first received this, I would just pray in tongues hours at a time. And as I would do that, I would just be praying with my understanding as I spoke in tongues and people would start coming to my mind that I hadn't thought of in years. People that for whatever reason, you know, we'd gone different direction, things that I wouldn't have ever thought of just in myself. I would have never have thought of these people, but all of a sudden they'd come to mind and I'd start praying for them. And then within a day or two, 
that person that I hadn't seen in four or five years would all of a sudden come across my path. And I would have already been praying for them. And I would be prepared. And I would be able to minister to them. And the very first time that happened, I didn't catch it. But I mean, it began to be a regular occurrence that every time I would pray in tongues for a prolonged period of time, and as I was praying in tongues, I was praying with my understanding, I would just start praying for people and praying about things that I would have never have prayed about. And within a day or two, I would see those exact people and things would happen. I'm telling you, most people just do things on their own. And it is just so much better to let the Holy Spirit flow through you. And speaking in tongues is one of those things that when you start speaking in tongues, your mind is going to think, this is foolish. I don't understand what's happening. And you are going to do one of two things. Either you are going to shut off speaking in tongues and operate just out of your intellect and ability. Or if you continue to speak in tongues, your mind is going to have to submit. Your flesh is going to have to submit to the Spirit. You're going to have to give priority, preeminence to the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, man, that is powerful. That is powerful to submit and to yield to the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the reasons why speaking in tongues is so powerful because it is against your natural mind, your natural thinking. It makes zero sense to the carnal mind. There is no proof in the natural of anything. You have to push into a realm of faith. You have to get beyond being carnal. And you have to step into a realm of faith to speak in tongues. And that right there is powerful. It says in Jude chapter 1, verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. It says that when you are praying in the Holy Ghost, and that's referring to speaking in tongues, you are building yourself on your most holy faith. You know, there are varying degrees of faith. And again, when you start speaking in tongues, your natural mind is going to say, this is silly, this is foolish, I don't even understand what I'm saying. There's going to be a natural resistance towards it. And if you continue to speak in tongues, it makes you yield to the Holy Spirit. It makes the Holy Spirit have preeminence. And I guarantee you, it's just like flipping a switch. It's just like opening a door or something. And it just starts a flood of the Holy Spirit and His wisdom and His power and His strength towards you. Speaking in tongues is powerful. And I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need some power. Jesus said you would receive power. That word there is dunamis. It means miraculous, miracle-working power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you could just look at the disciples. Did you know prior to them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they all forsook Jesus and they fled. I mean, Jesus would say things like in John chapter 14, he says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And immediately Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. He just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Philip says, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. There's a reason why they call those guys duh disciples. <laughs> I mean, they were just dull. They did not seem to get it. And then the day of Pentecost came. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, these guys who uh, they'd say, Jesus would say, where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. And they go, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? They just couldn't seem to get it. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter stands up and preaches a sermon. And 3,000 people get saved on the day of Pentecost. He had recollection of Scripture. He tied in the Old Testament Scriptures from Joel chapter 2. And he just preached a message that was powerful. And right after that, they got arrested for preaching the gospel. And when they stood before the scribes and the Pharisees, it says the scribes and the Pharisees took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They could see a difference in these disciples. And they could tell that it was different. And it says that boldness, they spoke with boldness. I mean, they were changed from night to daylight. It was a huge change in them. And you know what the difference was? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you now have the same power that's in heaven living on the inside of you. And if you will believe and receive, you can release this supernatural power flowing through you. That's what Jesus said, Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power, dunamis, miraculous power when the Holy Spirit comes. People who reject the Holy Spirit do not believe in miraculous power manifest in your bodies, in your finances, in casting out of devils and stuff like that. People who do believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not just automatic that they work in miracles, but they are more prone. That is the doorway, the, the entrance into the supernatural. And I'm telling you, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you know that there's got to be more to the Christian life than just getting saved and stuck and waiting until you die and go to heaven before anything happens, I'm telling you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's what you need. And speaking in tongues, when you pray in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, your spirit is praying, the part of you that was born again at salvation, and you start releasing this supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Here's another verse that some people use in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 28. It says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. That's talking about speaking in tongues. And in verse 29, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the obvious answer to every one of those questions is no, not all do these things. And people have taken this to say that, see, not all speak in tongues. Now, again, there's a large segment that believes that speaking in tongues has passed away, and anybody who does that today, that that is of the devil. I reject that completely based on all of the scriptures that we've already talked about, that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance, Romans chapter 11. But there are some who will say, okay, some people speak in tongues, but then there's many that don't. And they will use this verse to say not all speak in tongues. But look at it in context. He says in verse 29, are all apostles? No, not everybody's called to be an apostle. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? But see, these are talking about ministry gifts that operate in the church. There is a difference between a person who teaches. The scripture says that every one of us is supposed to be able to give an answer for the hope of the calling that lies within us, that we are supposed to teach others. We're supposed to go and make disciples and teach them to observe all things. So every Christian is supposed to be able to teach other people what God has taught them. But are all teachers? No. Not everybody is given a gift of teaching. Not everybody is called to the vocation of teaching. That's what my gifting is. God has called me to do it. So not all of you, not matter of fact, not many of you are called to do what I'm doing. But every one of you should be able to teach other people. You should be able to make disciples, teaching them to observe all things, Matthew 28, 20. And so does this mean that so only some people teach? No, everybody teaches. But some people are called to a ministry of teaching. And it goes on to say, do all have the gifts of healing? You know, it says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So it's God's will for everybody to be well. And it says in Mark chapter 16, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Uh, they shall drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt, hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you're a believer, you should be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. But there are some people that have a gift of healing. This isn't talking about you just praying a prayer of faith. There are some people that have a gift of healing, a gift of miracles. That's different. That's talking about a ministry vocation. Not everybody is called to the vocation of the healing ministry, but every born-again believer can minister healing. 
And in this same context, it says, do all speak with tongues? The obvious answer is no, but this isn't saying that you can't speak in the gift of tongues that accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is saying that not everybody has this gift of speaking in tongues that operates in a church service where you give out a message and then interpret it, which uh, speaking in tongues with an interpretation is equal to prophecy. It says that right here in these verses. And so this is saying that not everybody has this ministry gift of speaking in tongues. But this has nothing to do with every individual speaking in tongues privately on their own, any more than it means that not everybody can pray for the sick. No, there's many scriptures that talks about every person can pray for the sick, but there's some people that have a ministry gift of healing. Every person should be able to teach. We're commanded to teach others to observe all things, but not everybody is called to a vocation of teaching like I am. So you see what this is saying? This is not saying that not everybody can speak in tongues. Again, going back to Mark chapter 16, if you are a believer, these signs will follow them that believe, then you should speak in tongues. This is for the believer. Any person who receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit can speak in tongues. And I know somebody right now is listening and saying, so are you saying I have to speak in tongues? No, I'm saying you get to speak in tongues. It's available to you, and it is a powerful gift. Now, it does say in John chapter 14, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. Let me just turn over and read this so that I don't misquote it. But he was getting ready to leave. This is the night before his crucifixion, and he was talking to his disciples, and he spoke to them many times about the importance of the Holy Spirit. And it says in John chapter 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus right here was talking about the comforter, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. And he says that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. And I could spend more time on this, but he's just basically saying people that aren't born again, people that don't have a relationship with God cannot receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive salvation is when Jesus comes into your heart. You receive Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that Jesus is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. You cannot receive the gift of the Holy Spirit until you receive the giver of the Holy Spirit. So you first of all have to be born again. You have to have a relationship with God. You had to have received the forgiveness of your sins and been what Jesus called being born again. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, that when you speak in tongues, your spirit prays. Your spirit, not your brain, but your spirit and your spirit is a part of you that has the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. You've been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created you, Colossians 3, 10. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. That's not true of your brain, but it's true of your born-again spirit. And when you start speaking in tongues, you start releasing this supernatural wisdom of God. Man, that's powerful. You need this gift. You need to be able to communicate beyond your understanding. You know, I was sharing a little bit earlier in this series about that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was three and a half years later before I spoke in tongues, and it was because I'd been taught against it and taught that it was of the devil. And the Lord doesn't force you to speak in tongues. And so it took me a while to renew my mind, and I had been studying this, and I got to a place to where I was hungry for it and I wanted it, and I was out one. This is back before I was married, and it was late at night, and there was a field out close to our house. I mean, probably 10, 15 acres. It was just an open field. And I was out there praying late at night, and I was just so blessed. I loved the Lord. I'd already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And man, the, it says in Romans chapter 5 that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto you. And I was just so in love with the Lord. I was out there praising God, and I had been there for hours 
just worshiping and praising God. But it was frustrating because I want, I just, I felt more in my heart than what I could formulate in my brain and say with my mouth. And I was struggling and I was frustrated. And I actually got to singing this old Baptist song that we sang about, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And I was thinking of that. And as soon as I sang that and thought it, the Lord spoke to me and He says, I'm wanting to give you another tongue and you won't even receive one tongue. Here you are praying for a thousand tongues. <laughs> and I just realized that one of the reasons for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so that you can praise God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm not sure the exact verse on this, but it says that if you speak in tongues, you verily give thanks well. When you are praying in tongues, your spirit is praising God. And I saw all of this, and that's when I decided that, man, if speaking in tongues is going to help me to praise the Lord and to love the Lord and communicate better, because I just was frustrated. I love the Lord more than I could verbalize. And that's when I started speaking in tongues. I said, man, that's it. And I just started speaking in tongues, believing that I was bypassing the limitations of my brain and I was speaking out of my limitless, born-again spirit, praising Him. And as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, giving thanks well, praising Him in a proper way. Speaking in tongues will allow you to go beyond yourself. It, in, it just empowers you. It gives you an ability that is beyond yourself. The Apostle Paul said, and I've already read these verses, but I want to make a dis different application of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 4, he says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And so Paul was saying that he spoke in the wisdom of God, not in the wisdom of man. And he says that none of the princes of this world knew this wisdom or they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, put this together with 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where he's talking about speaking in tongues. And he says in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Follow after charity, God's kind of love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Again, this goes back to the fact that not all speaking in tongues is talking about a known language. This is talking about speaking in unknown languages. No man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now look at that. He says that when you are speaking in tongues, in the Spirit, it's your spirit praying, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, and your spirit is praying mysteries. You're speaking mysteries. Put this together with what Paul just said in chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. When you speak in tongues, you are, your spirit is praying out mysteries. And Paul said that the gospel that he preached was speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery. Let me just ask you this. Where do you think that Paul got this revelation of the grace of God? He wrote half of the books of the New Testament. Of course, he was taught the word at the feet of Gamaliel, but that isn't where he got all of this. He might have got the information. He might have had the... You know, it's like a computer. You load this stuff into a computer, but you have to have these programs to be able to draw that knowledge out, yeah, to be able to use it. You have to have a system running that can utilize that programming. Paul was programmed with the truth of the Old Testament Scriptures, but when he received Jesus as his Lord, Ananias came and laid hands on him and he received the Holy Spirit. He spoke in tongues. He was called into the ministry. And then by Paul's own admission in Galatians chapter 1, he went into the desert for three and a half years. I believe when he was in the desert, he spoke in tongues. And you know what happened? 
As he spoke the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery, he just began to interpret it. Look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We just read verse 14. It says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Verse 13 says, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So if you speak in tongues, what are you speaking in tongues? 1 Corinthians 14, 2, you are speaking the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery. And what do you do? You pray that you interpret. And God just supernaturally starts revealing. You aren't speaking gibberish when you speak in tongues. There's a lot of people that criticize it and say it's gibberish. You're speaking in foolishness. It doesn't mean anything. No, it does mean something. And some people say, well, that doesn't sound like a real language to me. Did you know I've actually read some things about the Wycliffe translators that have found people that their language is nothing but whistles, different tones of whistles. There was another group that I read about that it was just the clicking of the tongue and how many times you clicked your tongue was the way that they talked. That doesn't sound like a real language, but it is. And they've actually translated the Bible into these languages that only whistle or click the tongue and do things like this. So what I'm saying is some people, you know, want to judge and criticize. There's some languages that are clicking of the tongue, whistle. It doesn't matter. You can't sit here and judge it. It may sound like foolishness to you, but the truth is, if you're doing this in faith and responding to the Lord properly, you are communicating in God in a heavenly language. You are speaking the hidden wisdom of God. You are releasing things out of your spirit that are awesome. Again, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that you have the mind of Christ, not up here in your little peanut-sized brain, but down here in your spirit. You have the mind of Christ. 1 John 2.20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. That's not true of your mind. You, if you can't pass a test and make a hundred every single time on every single test that is ever given. With your mind, you don't know all things, but in your spirit, you know all things. Colossians 3.10 says, Put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You, in your spirit, you have a supernatural understanding. If you're confused, if you don't know what's going on, if you're born again, your spirit's not confused. Your spirit has the mind of Christ. It has an unction from the Holy One. It knows all things. It's been renewed in knowledge. You do not have a knowledge problem in your spirit. You have it in your head and your head can be like a roadblock. How do you get, how do you release things if you can't understand it? When you start speaking in tongues, you're bypassing your brain. You're communicating with God straight out of your spirit. But does that mean that your mind doesn't receive any benefit? Well, it could be that way if you don't understand and if you don't know how to believe God. But if you would just do what this says and if you pray in an unknown tongue, Pray also that you may interpret. Ask God for an interpretation of your tongue. Man, that is powerful. Now, I'll concede this. These instructions are talking about how the gift of speaking in tongues operates in a church assembly. And it's saying you only prophesy, you only speak in tongues by two or at the most by three and only if there's a person to interpret it. And this is talking about a church assembly and it's saying that if you pray in tongues, you have to also pray for an interpretation of that tongue so that the other people can be benefited. And I agree that that is the context and that is primarily what this is talking about. But Paul said in this same chapter that he says, I speak in tongues more than y'all. And so it wasn't in the church because he said in the church, I'd rather speak five words, 10 words with my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So the speaking in tongues isn't limited to church. You can pray in tongues privately. Matter of fact, the vast majority of all of my speaking in tongues is done privately. It's not done in church. So this isn't limited to church. This can apply to your own private relationship with the Lord. Paul spoke in tongues more than them all, but not in the church. It was at home or it was in private. And he, in the same way that he said, if you speak in tongues, pray that you interpret. I believe that that'll work in your private time with the Lord too. So here's one of the greatest things that the Lord ever taught me. 
And that is that when I'm speaking in tongues, I don't always know how to pray as I ought up here with my brain, but my spirit has the mind of Christ. I'm speaking the hidden wisdom of God, and all I've got to do is just pray and ask God for an interpretation of my tongues, and God gives me supernatural revelation. Man, that is powerful. Let me give you an example. This building that I'm sitting in right now, this is our office building that's in Colorado Springs. We've got our sanctuary up in Woodland Park. This is where we're building a Bible college campus, and we've now expanded it to be three, uh, 493 acres. It's going to be awesome. So anyway, we've got all of that going, but I still have 200-plus employees down here in Colorado Springs. And this building that I'm in right now where our television studio is, when we first got this building, I took out a loan for $3.2 million to buy this. This was in 2002. And it was going to cost $3.2 million to renovate it. Right where I'm sitting, right here, this was originally a woodworking shop, and this was just an open warehouse, and there was none of this here. And so we had to spend $3.2 million to refurbish this building. And so when we got the loan to buy this building, the same banker told us he was going to give us a construction loan. He said, I wouldn't have given you the loan to buy it if you couldn't have enough money to develop it and use it. And so he says, it's guaranteed. You've got the construction loan. In a week or two, you'll have all the money you need to do this construction. Well, that went on for nine months. And nine months, he told me, next week, for sure. Next week. And for nine months, he just delayed us and put us off. And finally, we had a little come to Jesus meeting where I said, hey, it's been nine months. What's going to happen? And he finally said, you know, it's been so long. Let's just get a new appraisal. Let's start the whole process over. And all I could see was another nine months. And so I said, this is unacceptable. I mean, our ministry was at a critical place. We had a little tiny place over on Robinson Street in Colorado Springs that could house just a maximum of a little over a hundred, and we had it maxed out. We had actually porta potties outside and made the men go outside in the winter to use these porta potties and turned all of the indoor toilets into women's uh, toilets. And I mean, we just couldn't grow. The school was going to literally be choked to death if we didn't get something, and I just couldn't see another nine months or a year. We needed to get this building fixed now. So. I told him, I said, you, you just let me pray about this. And so I went home. And anyway, it's a long story. But when I finally got by myself, I have a trail that I've built on my property. And I started walking that trail. It's a two and a half mile round trip. And I started walking. And before I got a hundred yards down that trail, I started praying in tongues. And I said, Father, I know that my born again spirit has an unction from the Holy One and it knows all things. There is a way to get this building finished. And I said, I'm going to start praying in tongues and let the part of me that has the mind of Christ speak out the hidden wisdom of God. And then I said, and I pray that you would give me an interpretation. And before I walked a hundred yards, less than the length of a football field, I was praying in tongues and asking God for an interpretation, and all of a sudden I had a, a prophecy that had been given to me two years before this come back to my remembrance. And this prophecy said, it was talking about the expansion that the Lord was going to give our ministry, and it says, and you aren't going to need uh, to take out a loan because you have a bank. And I remember when this person said that, I've got a bank. I thought, what bank do I have? And he went on to say, your partners are your bank. And your partners are going to enable you to do this debt-free. Now, see, I was praying in tongues and asking God for wisdom. And then just, I mean, within seconds, I had this prophecy that I hadn't thought of in two years come back to my remembrance. You know what that was? That was an interpretation. The spirit within me was reminding my brain of something that God had said to me in a prophecy that I had forgotten and I had gotten away from. And so when I, I thought, that's, that's it. That's the answer to my problem. But this was a big deal because at the rate we had been saving money, we had about $30,000 saved, and that had been over multiple years. I sat down with a pen and paper and figured out at the rate we had been able to save money to come up with $3.2 million, I, I would probably be 120-something years old. 
And so in the natural, it wasn't going to happen. And if I committed to doing this debt-free and took this as an interpretation of my tongue and that this was God's wisdom for me, and if I committed myself to that, it says in Psalms 15, 4, that a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. I wasn't going to just head in this direction and if it didn't work out, change. No, if I said that I was going to finish this building without taking out a loan, then I was going to do it. And if, if this wasn't God, it would have killed our ministry because it would have been, it would have been 60 years before I'd have been able to accumulate that much money. But you know, I prayed about it and I finally came to the conclusion that this is the Holy Spirit. And so I made a decision. I came in and told the manager of our ministry, I said, if they offer me all of the money we need tomorrow, I'm not taking it. We're going to do this debt free. And sure enough, the very next day, they offered me not $3.2 million. They said, we'll give you $4 million. They offered me all of that money the next day, and I said, you're a day late. And I refused it. And did you know in 14 months, we brought in that $3.2 million, and we were able to finish out this building, and we occupied it. And then in 2009, the Lord told me we needed to get a new place, and we bought the place up in Woodland Park, which that was a miracle. Just in the last month or so, we have actually closed on another 336 acres with a 60,000 uh, square foot building on it, which gives us a total of 493. We're doing all of this stuff debt-free. In the last four and a half years, I have spent over $70 million debt-free on buildings. And that's in addition to our three million, three and a half million that we need to pay our television bill, our 650 employees, our all of the other things. And you know how all of that got started? By praying in tongues and asking for a revelation. And God brought back to me something that I had totally spaced and forgotten. And it has proven to be the Lord. Right now, we probably have over a hundred million dollars in assets. And at the time I was telling you about in 2002, we probably didn't even have a million dollars worth of assets. You know how all that happened? By praying in tongues and asking God what I'm supposed to do. And God just began to interpret to me and show me what to do. I don't know how you make it if you don't pray in tongues. Let me share some scriptures with you that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. This is in John chapter 14 and in verse 16. He says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. And you know, if you look this word another up in the Greek right here, it's talking about another just like me. In other words, give, give you someone just like me. And so he says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter just like me that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then go down to verse 26. It says, but the comforter, and this is speaking of the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You know, this is a verse that in the very beginning, when I first became aware of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, after this experience where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in spoken tongues, this is one of the very first verses that the Lord led me to and I have depended upon this big time. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And I, I recognized that I needed the Holy Spirit to just supernaturally quicken things to me. One of the first things that the Lord told me to do after I had my miraculous encounter with the Lord in 1968, He told me to quit school and of course, uh, people saw that I'd gotten really turned on to the Lord and they thought, well, maybe I'll quit secular school, but I'll go to cemetery, I mean seminary, and um, graduate from there. But the Lord just led me not to do any of that. And people immediately began to start telling me that, you know, how are you ever going to be able to prosper in the ministry? You've not been trained. You've not been taught. And the Lord gave me scriptures like John chapter 7 and others, but specifically this verse right here, that the Holy Spirit would teach me all things. 
And I put this together with 1 John 2.20 where it says that you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. And I started just drawing on this revelation knowledge is what I call it. Not knowledge that you just learn that somebody teaches you, but it's revealed unto you. Again, take these verses about that you've been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created you. Colossians 3.10, 1 Corinthians 2.26, you have the mind of Christ. 1 John 2.20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. 1 John 2.27, you need not that any man teach you, but as that same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as He hath taught you, you shall abide in Him. I believe that there is a revelation knowledge that comes to us that doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. That is huge, what I'm saying right here. And some people, this you don't even, you've never thought about this, but I'm telling you that the knowledge that God has placed within every born-again believer is awesome. And the way we draw it out is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned this last week, but the really the number one thing, the biggest change in my life wasn't just speaking in tongues when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not diminishing that. That was important, and I still speak in tongues. I've spoken in tongues today. I do it a lot. I'm not diminishing that, but the biggest change in my life was the revelation knowledge of the Holy Spirit. God began to teach me supernaturally. And I don't, I'm not making any claims that I've got everything figured out and that I know it all, but I can guarantee you, I know more than I used to, and it came by revelation from the Holy Spirit. I may not have arrived, but I've left, and I'm telling you, I took this verse that the Holy Spirit the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And I begin to draw on this. When I first got married, October the 27th, 1972, um, I immediately quit my job, which in hindsight, I think I probably should have kept working until my ministry got big enough to support us. But anyway, my head was wrong, but my heart was right in this thing. I just wanted to devote myself full-time to ministry. And so what I did, Jamie and I had a little apartment in uh, Dallas, Texas, when we first got married. And because I'd quit my job and I'd gone full-time in the ministry, but I didn't have a ministry yet, I just spent day after day after day just reading and studying the Word, praying in tongues and asking God for an interpretation. And this is back before we had computers. I actually took one of these yellow pads and I wrote out probably, uh, well, it was two or three pages, I think it was three pages of this yellow pad front and back with nothing but just scripture verses. I'd go all the way across one line and fill it up with the references, not not writing the verse out, but just the references. There were hundreds of verses that as I studied the Word, I just knew that God was speaking to me through these, but it was so contrary to the things that I had been taught that I was just unable to unlock the power that was in these verses. And they were, and so I would just, what I would do, I spent writing out all of these scripture references, and then every day I would get up and I would sit down and longhand, this is again before we had a computer, I would longhand just write out every word in these hundreds of verses. And I would spend somewhere around 10 to 15 hours a day just writing out every one of these verses and meditating on them, every word as I wrote them out. And I would write them out. And then after I had done that for 10 hours or, or whatever, it wasn't uh, a, just an established thing, but I'd probably spend a minimum of 8 to 10, 12 hours a day doing that. Then we had just one little bedroom apartment. I would actually go into a walk-in closet that we had and shut the door and move the shoes out of the way. And I would sit in that closet so that I wouldn't disturb Jamie because it's just a one bedroom apartment. There was nowhere else to go. And I'd get in that closet and I'd pray in tongues for an hour or two hours asking God 
for this revelation knowledge. And I would sit here and say, Father, your Holy Spirit will guide me into all truth. Teach me all things. Bring all things to my remembrance. And I would just pray in tongues and ask God for revelation. What is the Word saying here? And basically what I was grappling with was the legalism that I was brought up in that was basically performance-based where you have to do this and then God responds to you and does that. That's where I believe most Christians live today. And yet I was seeing scriptures that it's not based on my performance, that it's already done, that by His stripes we were healed. I don't have to do something to get God to heal me, but I was already healed. And I could see these things, but it just didn't jive with what I had been taught. And there was this conflict. And so after I studied the Word for 10 hours or whatever, I would sit in a closet and pray for an hour or two in tongues and ask God for revelation, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to me what these things are saying. And I did that probably for six months. And then after six months, there was one week where I mean it's just like an atomic bomb went off on the inside of me. All of a sudden, I saw it. I began to see the grace of God. I began to understand things that I had never heard another person say. Now, I'm sure that there were people saying it, but I'm saying in my limited scope, I had never heard anybody say this, but I'd been studying the Word, and the Holy Spirit just supernaturally revealed things to me. And it was coming so fast and furious. God was just answering questions and revealing things to me that I honestly asked the Lord to stop giving me revelation because I felt like I was getting more than what I could handle and that I wasn't going to be able to retain it all. And in one week's time, I mean, basically, I got an overview of all of the things that God has shown me in the subsequent 45 years. Now, I'm not saying that I had the detail. God has given me more revelation and better ways of seeing it and illustrating it and a deeper understanding and things like that. But I'm saying that in kind of an outline, I just got the outline of nearly everything that the Lord has shown me in the last 45 years. I got it in that one week. It just was like a download. God just downloaded revelation to me and I began to see things that changed my life, that changed my ministry, and now has changed the lives of millions of people. And how did all of this happen? It was through studying the Word, but I was struggling to understand the Word, and I drew on the power of the Holy Spirit, and specifically this verse, that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And I used that verse, and I specifically started speaking in tongues and asking for an interpretation. And I really believe that the revelation that God gave me and this understanding of the grace of God, I believe it came because of my ability to submit to the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues and asking Him to give me revelation. Man, that's powerful. I know that there's some people that may not understand what I'm talking about, but if you could understand and if you could see what happened with me, this is priceless to have the Holy Spirit supernaturally quicken to you and give you a revelation knowledge, not something that you just hear somebody else say and you just take their word for it, but it be it's revealed unto you, quickened unto you by the Holy Spirit. That's priceless. You know, another thing that I do, I used to take copious notes back when I first got turned on to the Lord. And I'd go listen to people and I'd write down nearly every word that they say. And then I'd go back and study them. And did you know over the years, as I got back and I was studying some of that, I realized I wrote down something here that that's, that's not right. And maybe what the person said, but it wasn't right. It wasn't scriptural. It was off base. Maybe sometimes totally wrong, other times just a little bit wrong. And I began to start relying on this verse. And instead of just writing notes and writing everything and depending on just my natural mind and my notes to remember, I started drawing on the Holy Spirit to remind me whatever Jesus had said unto me. And you know, this is the perfect note-taking system because the Holy Spirit will only bring back to your remembrance what Jesus said, not what that person said that was of them or of somebody else. 
the Holy Spirit will only bring back to our remembrance what Jesus said. And so now when I listen to a person, I very seldom take notes. Sometimes I will. There's something I want to remember. But most of the time, I'm just focused on them and I'm letting the Holy Spirit write these things upon my heart. And I trust that if it's God that was really speaking to me through this person, that the Holy Spirit will bring it back to my remembrance. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not against anybody who takes notes. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying for me, I have just drawn on this and I depend on the Holy Spirit to quicken things to my memory. And it is phenomenal, the things that God quickens to me. You know, my staff has actually taken bets before that if we go on a camping trip and things that I've done with some of my friends here, they've taken bets about how much I'll forget. <laughs> it's amazing uh, what I forget. But you know what? I can remember Scripture. I've got the recall of thousands and thousands of Scriptures, and I don't sit down and memorize a verse and do that. I let the Holy Spirit quicken it to me. And I depend upon this, and because of it, the Holy Spirit just brings things to my remembrance. You know, I'm now doing a lot of things on live stream. We have a live stream Bible study every Tuesday night that we are broadcasting. We've had up to 19,000 people watching that live from 26 different nations. And I'm beginning to do this. And so we've hired some people that, you know, deal with this social media, how to push it out and how to get these people to listen. I don't understand all that stuff. And anyway, they're always coming to me and wanting me to just you know, see my notes and see my outlines and how, and I don't do stuff like that. And it's, uh, these people are beginning to adjust to me and recognize that I'm not going to change. But I don't have any notes. I don't have anything. I'm sharing with you out of my heart and the Holy Spirit quickens and brings things back to my remembrance. And it's just, to me, a much better way to minister. It's coming out of my heart. I'm sharing from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit quickens me and gives me things to say. Now, I will admit this. This is the downside of the way I minister, and that is that if you aren't seeking God with your whole heart, if you don't live by faith, if you just visit there every once in a while, and you have all kinds of junk flowing in and out of your heart, and then you start opening up and you share out of your heart, and if what you've got in your heart's not good, then you're in trouble. But if you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord and if you're seeking God, well, then you can just minister out of the overflow of your heart. And it makes it so simple that, man, I could not minister the way I do if it wasn't for that. You know, yesterday I ministered, I think it was five hours, and I had meetings all day long, but I ministered five hours solid. Today I'll be ministering about six to seven hours solid. So that right there is somewhere around 12, 13 hours in two days. It's not unusual for me to minister 20, and I, I used to minister up to 40 times a week. I've now put a limit on it of 20 times a week in school, in Bible studies, television programs, and I'll minister an average of about 20 times a week. And you know why? Because I depend upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit to bring back to my remembrance, to quicken things to me, to speak through me, and I'm telling you, I could not minister as much as I do and do what I'm doing if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. You know, it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. We are supposed to not lean unto our own understanding. We're supposed to renew our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's just many, many scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Spiritual warfare is not really done out in the heavens. It's done right between your ears. It's thoughts that Satan fights us with. And when you submit your mind to the Holy Spirit by praying in tongues and bypassing your brain, I guarantee you, it just does wonderful things. I honestly 
attribute a tremendous amount of all of the good things that God has done in my life to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Now, we're going to be talking next week about other gifts of the Holy Spirit, how you flow in the gifts of the Spirit, etc. I'm not saying that speaking in tongues is the only thing, but it's kind of like a first step. It's an initial thing. And, and your spirit is the part that is changed. When you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. And by you yielding to that and speaking in tongues, it makes your entire body and mind yield to God. And it just starts a flow of the Holy Spirit that is supernatural. Man, I believe that every born-again Christian should be speaking in tongues. They don't. They don't have to. I've said this earlier, but you can go to heaven without the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and you can even get there quicker because you aren't going to have the power that Jesus spoke about in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Satan will be able to kill you and wipe you out with something, and you can get to heaven quicker without the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important. That has just changed so many things in my life. This is not limited to a church service where you stand up and deliver a message in tongues and then another person or you comes back and interprets it in the known language. It includes that. But you can also do this in your private time with the Lord. You can pray in tongues and it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. And then the 13th verse says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So when you're praying in tongues, it's your spirit praying the hidden wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. And all you got to do is pray and ask for an interpretation. But I wanted to make this clear because when I talk about this, most people think that for you to pray in tongues and then interpret, it means that you, you quit praying in tongues and then you interpret it and speak forth a prophecy in English or whatever your known language is. If you're in a church service, that's the way it would have to be. It has to be you, the person who is speaking in tongues has to stop and then another person or that same person gives forth what the interpretation of that is in the known language. And so if you're in a church assembly, that's the way it is. But if you're by yourself, just look at this. It says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my understanding is unfruitful. All you need to do to interpret is just have your understanding become fruitful. If you're by yourself, if you aren't in a church service, you don't have to speak in tongues and then stop and all of a sudden have a prophecy that comes out in your known language. No, all you got to do is have your understanding become fruitful. And I made reference to some of this, but when you pray in tongues, again, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, it's your spirit prays, not your brain. And you can't just turn your mind off. I said I've met some people who act like they've turned their brain off, but the truth is your mind is functioning all the time. And during your waking hours, you can't just sit there and not think. So if it's your spirit praying and not your mind praying, well, then what are you doing with your mind? Well, what I do, and again, I don't know that you have to do it this way, but what I do is I start praying with my understanding at the same time that I'm praying in tongues. If I was to go off and allow myself just to do something else and say, for instance, watch a TV show or read a book or do something, well, my mind will eventually focus my attention so much on those other things that I'm doing that I would quit praying in tongues. For me to continue to pray in tongues for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or whatever, I have to keep my mind stayed on the Lord in the way I do that is I pray with my understanding in my thoughts at the same time that I'm praying with tongues. And then if I ask for an interpretation, I don't have to stop praying in tongues and speak for something in English. I just sit there and um, as I'm praying, I've learned that God will mold my thoughts and mold my prayers. And I'm actually praying with my understanding the interpretation of what I'm saying in tongues. I don't know if that helps you, but that really helped me. I've never heard anybody teach this, but I'm just telling you this is how it operates in my life. Let me put a little parenthesis here and a disclaimer on this. You know, you can't just 
be praying in tongues, and then whatever comes to your mind, you interpret that as this is the interpretation, this is what God's telling me to do. Because when you're praying in tongues, again, it's your spirit praying, but your flesh, you can do things wrong. You can get wrong thoughts. I've had people before that came up with things like God. I was praying in tongues and God told me I was supposed to divorce this person and go marry this person. God's not going to tell you to go, you know, commit adultery, to go out and steal, to rob, to plunder, and things like that. You have to take every thought that you have captive. I read those verses earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, that the weapons of our warfare take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. And just because you're praying in tongues does not mean that every thought that you have is going to be pure and from God. Some of us have a lot of ungodliness in our life. We have a past that has taught us to think and feel things contrary to the Word of God. And sad to say, way too many Christians are still plugged into this world and watching and listening to and reading things that are depositing thoughts on the inside of you that you should not have. And just because you're praying in tongues doesn't mean that every thought that you have will be perfect. Your thoughts, uh, you can bring up negative thoughts. You could have thoughts of anger and bitterness and who knows whatever. So you still have to test everything that you think God is inspiring. It has to be held up to the Word of God. The Word of God is the litmus test against every thought. God will never say anything to you that contradicts the Word of God. The Spirit and the Word agrees what it says in 1 John. And so if, if you're praying in tongues and you feel like all of a sudden something comes to you and you think that this is God, you have to be able to verify it by the Word of God. Is it consistent with the Word? If He's telling you to go commit adultery, is that in the Word? Does God want you to commit adultery? Certainly not. If you feel like, man, I need money. I think I'll go rob this convenience store. And you were praying in tongues and that's, what you, that's the first thought that came to you. I can guarantee you that's not God. God is not going to have you steal. Thou shalt not steal is what Exodus chapter 20 says. So you have to take everything and you have to compare, compare it with the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that um, the Word of God is quick. And the word quick there means alive, living. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Man, that's a great passage right there. It says that the Word of God will discern whether this is the, you know, the thoughts and the intents, where it comes from the spirit or whether it comes from the soul. So you have to know the Word of God. And if for some reason, say for instance, you have not spent time in the Word and you don't really know what the Word says and you start praying in tongues and you start having things come to you that you think it's God speaking to you and giving you these thoughts and these impressions. And if you don't know the Word of God, then you better take those thoughts to someone who does know the Word of God and submit your thoughts and your impressions to them and get them to judge it. You should be able to do that, but if you aren't at that stage yet, you should at least have somebody in your life who you consider to be a mature Christian, and you need to submit your thoughts and impressions to them and let them judge it. And you know, because when you're praying in tongues, the way that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, He speaks to you in impressions, and you just have knowledge. You just know things. You know, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we'll talk about that's listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a discerning of spirits. And there are so many times that I've just come into a situation and I see a person and I know something about them. I just perceive that something's wrong. I know that this isn't right. I can perceive that they're discouraged, depressed, whatever. And of course, some people would say, well, it's because of their body language. Sometimes there's physical things that may give you an indication, but there have been times that I've known things about people that there is no way for me to know it. It is not anything natural. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a discerning of the spirits. And I just know things. 
and I have these impressions about people. And then once I discern that there's a problem, I'll start saying, God, what's the problem? And he'll give me a word of knowledge and show me something and tell me exactly what the problem is. And then a word of wisdom will be, all right, I've discerned that there's a problem. Now I know what the problem is. And the word of wisdom is, all right, how do I speak the word of God to them in a way that helps them to deal with it? And so you'll see those gifts of the Holy Spirit function. And this is how the Lord speaks to you, is through these thoughts and impressions. It's, it's subjective because you have all kinds of thoughts and feelings and impressions. And how do you tell which one? How do you know if this is really God speaking this to you or not? Well, again, the scripture is the acid test. You have to compare everything up against the scripture. And uh, there's some things that, you know what? It's just not clear cut. Like the scripture is not going to tell you by this house by the red car over there. There isn't a scripture that says that, but there are scriptures that tell you how to get very clear direction from the Lord. For instance, one of the ones that I use a lot in my life is in Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, where it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That does not mean that if you just delight yourself in the Lord, He's going to give you anything you want. You want a million dollar house. You want this person's wife over there. You like her better than yours. And he's going to give you whatever you want. No, that's not what this is talking about. It's saying when you delight yourself in the Lord, God puts his desires in your heart. That is totally different than what some of you have thought. And because of this, here's some of the ways that I tell whether these thoughts and feelings and impressions that I feel like God is speaking to me, it's how I tell whether this is God or whether it's just me, whether it's just my flesh. When I get an impression and a feeling, what I will do, I will seek the Lord. And if I have any doubt about whether this is God leading me, I'll just separate myself under the Lord. I'll cancel something. I'll stay home. I'll study the word. I'll pray. I might fast. I might listen to praise music or something, but I just get my heart and my mind stayed on God. And again, this, I don't know how to explain this, but I can tell when I'm focused on God and when I'm not. There is a peace, there is a joy, there is a satisfaction. There's a sweet spot when you are with the Lord. And there are some times that I get occupied with things and people are saying things and doing things and I don't have that peace and that joy that I'm supposed to. But it says in Isaiah 26, 3, that the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. And when I get my mind really stayed on the Lord, there just comes a peace and a joy from God that I know that I'm where I need to be with the Lord. And so if I have something that I feel like God is telling me about, I will just put aside other things and I will delight myself on the Lord. I'll focus on the Lord until I know that I'm in that sweet spot, in that place where, man, I'm... I'm focused on God. And if that desire that I have continues and increases the more I seek God, well, then I, I believe that that's God giving me the desires of my heart. If the more I seek God and put my attention on the Lord and shut off other things, and the more I get into the presence and keep my mind stayed upon God, if the thing I was thinking of diminishes well, then it's not God. It was me. It was the flesh. Boy, that is powerful right there. And that's one of the greatest ways that God gives me direction. And again, all of this relates back to the Holy Spirit. Man, I take the things, I pray in tongues, and I'll get a revelation from God, and then I'll test that by the Word of God. But if it's something that doesn't have an exact scripture that says that, I will just start flowing in the Holy Spirit. I'll pray in tongues. I'll worship the Lord. I'll get into the presence of God. And if that desire continues and increases, then I take that as being the voice of God to me. And I know some of you think, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, let me just give you some examples that, you know, I was never going to have a Bible school. I had a lot of people ask me for a Bible school but I was never going to have one because I had seen people who graduated from Bible school and they were an embarrassment to me and to God. And I didn't want people come out of my school like that. And so I was displeased with the way that I saw Bible schools being done. 
But then in 1993, I was over in England, and I mean in one day's time, probably over a period of a week, but specifically one day, my desire for a Bible school just totally changed. From being to where I never wanted to have a Bible school, all of a sudden, man, I wanted a Bible school. I had... God showed me a way to do it that would be different, that would give practical application where we could actually disciple people instead of just teach people. And I got so excited that it was just awesome. And did you know that the contrast between my desires before that and my desire afterwards, I mean, in 24 hours, there was so, it was just like opposite directions. It was so dramatic that I suspected that this was the Lord, because in myself, I would never just totally change my desires like that. It was, it was just supernatural. I felt like it was God that gave it to me. But this was a big decision. So you know what? I began to pray about it. And I sat on it for a period of time, and I thought about it. And I'm not gonna, I don't have the time here to give you all the details, but I had it confirmed to me by a number of different people who came and said things to me that confirmed it. And because of that, I went with it. And here we are 23 years later. And did you know it has been probably one of the best decisions I've ever made? It has proven out to be God a thousand times over. And I never heard an audible voice. I didn't get a prophecy. It was just the desires of my heart. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit leads you when you receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit and start operating in these gifts, He just gives you the desires of your heart. He gives you peace. Did you know my whole television ministry started because of this exact same thing? Now, the Lord had already spoken to me, and I knew that someday I would be on television. But for probably 10 years, I had people offer me free television time. I had been guest on other people's television programs, and it was successful, and I knew that someday that was in my future. But I just didn't have a desire for it. And then in the summer of 1998, I mean, all of a sudden, in just one week's time, boom, my desires changed. And I had put people off and said, no, I don't want to be on television. All of a sudden, I was so excited about it. I lost a couple of nights sleep in one week because I was dreaming and drawing the set. The very first set, not the one you see behind me, but the very first set... 